Suppose we the waste of the free work. Me and maybe you don't have to stay sitting down for a walk. But um, I want to rip off some things that I had said about first of all, if you have a story that you, the possibility is the opposite of everything that you think is true. Like if Oprah got you on you know, TV and said, well, you know for sure that. That's your story. That's the thing that's sacred in the holy of holies of your temple. It's the thing that you would fight and die for, the thing that you would stand and live for. Maybe it's not true. Maybe the opposite of that is true. And if you can truly be with that, then there's a possibility of gnosis. There's a possibility of opening to the mystery that you can't speak about, that you can't turn into a story. So what interests me about the there's a civilization that we're in is that we're at the end of a story. We're at this end of a story that's been going on for thousands of years. And what most of us are doing is we're trying to go deeply into the source code of that story to the springs of the mysteries that are underneath and above that story so we can download again something that's healthy for our time, that's full of the mysteries, that's full of the sacred story that lives beyond religion and, and civilization. And some of the very core things of civilization are in the way of the mysteries. So if you were an alien coming to Earth and just <coughs> consulting, let's say Earth decided, okay, we're going to go to therapy because something's not fucking working, doesn't seem like it's going that well, maybe there's consciousness in the galaxy that could help us, maybe there's a therapist. The first thing the therapist would say, well, what's this kind of property ownership thing that your whole civilization is built on? Like, what's that about? Like, if you think you can own the crust of the earth? It's like, that seems to be creating some really deep distortions. So that's just one example. But if you look deeply into our civilization and what's at the root of it, what we think we know for sure, that's in the way of the evolution and growth. Just like some, sometimes people have their great evolution when the relationship that they gave everything into ends. And so everything that they knew for sure is now broken. Or their child dies, or they get fired from their job. So Earth as a being is going through that kind of initiation. It's like we all know it's not sustainable, we all know that we don't seem to be able to do anything about it within the civilization that we are in. So everybody does the best they can. But actually the only change is going to come from a deep, radical, experience of the sacred mysteries that are underneath civilization. So we're doing that as we come into this work together. We come into the willingness to put ourselves on the altar of listening to the mysteries so that they come through us in a way that refreshes the civilization of the world. And Peter Kingsley has this wonderful line where he says that all civilizations are created and destroyed from a state of ecstasy. All civilizations are created and destroyed from a state of ecstasy, which means you have to be in the ecstatic state in order to say no to the things that don't work and to bring forth the new. And one of the difficulties of being in the ecstatic state is that we have repressed whole parts of the sacred mysteries. So a few thousand years ago, of course it happened here, but it also happened in Egypt and it happened all, um, in India and all over the world was this huge revelation of the fact that the earth went around the sun. The huge revelation of light. That consciousness was this thing. Whether it's a soul or whether it's the, the gods and goddesses, it was a revelation of awareness. But what happened is that awareness got into a battle with the other light. So one of the things that I work with is rather than arguing with all of the different religions and spiritual traditions of the world, is just look into cosmos and see what's already been created and link our mythologies and our meta-narratives with what already is, rather than having to use Sanskrit terms or Hebraic terms or what actually is. So in cosmos, 
there is the moons going around planets, going around stars, going around stages of galaxies, going around superclusters in a universe that is expanding. And this is the meta narrative. This is the narrative we're all inside of. So in that narrative, when we discovered Earth went around the sun, all of a sudden the solar traditions came, the monotheistic traditions, that there is only one God traditions came. And they got into a battle with the lunar traditions. You could say this is masculine and feminine, but basically the lunar traditions are the light that's in matter, the serpent power, the kundalini, all of these energies that have been associated with the earth. And the solar traditions went to war with them. So the snakes were cast out of Ireland, the Kadeshes were thrown out of, um, out of Israel. All over the world, this battle between the serpent and the sun. So one of the things that we do when we come into sacred sexuality work is that we reawaken the serpent because we live in a culture where our sexuality has been somehow polarized against our consciousness and our spirituality. So the first work of this one um, is to remember that our body has a sacred current of energy that is balancing our consciousness. So when we can integrate the sun and the moon, now we can begin to touch the civilization that's coming, which is instead of the story of the sun at the center, whether it's Christian or Judaism or, or um, Mohammedism or Hinduism, instead of the story of light, now what's at the center is the dark mystery, the mystery of the black hole, the mystery of the point within all structures that other things spin around. And it's the mystery. If you're going to live in the mystery, you can't have a story. Your story just has to be like a set of clothes. Okay, I'm going to wear my Judaic story. I'm going to wear my Christian story. I'm going to wear my all of the stories of earth. You can wear if you get beyond them. But the only way to get beyond them is to realize that you are in a story. And the only way out of that story is to release the opposite of it, bring in the opposite of that story so you can be free. So the first work is to create balance between our masculine and feminine and between our lunar energy, our serpent power, and our consciousness. So, so much of this work is people trying to integrate those. Some people have done more of the ascension paths that have gone to consciousness, and if you follow consciousness all the way, it goes into the non -dual. It goes beyond the subject object. It goes beyond self and God. It goes beyond the beloved of bowing before God or the saying you are God. Because God is not something outside. It dissolves. So that's the path of consciousness. It moves towards the ocean, which allows the dissolution of self. But the sexual path also goes to a similar place. It goes beyond the me engaging you, you know, learning how to, to be clever sexually, to give you a better orgasm, to open up the channels, to run the chakras, to allow the serpent to rise. All of those things are wonderful, but they're preliminaries. They're preliminaries that they're just giving us back our inheritance of the lunar traditions. But just like the solar traditions have to go beyond subject object into the void, the Sexual mysteries have to go beyond the polarity into the singularity. Okay, so underneath the sexual currents of the serpent is the dragon, is the energy of matter itself. And so in order to awaken that in our own beings, we have to release and open the sexual mysteries. We have to blend them with the consciousness mysteries, and then we have to get beyond them. So in a civilization, that then the darkness is at the center. The darkness of what's beyond light, what's beyond duality. Then that becomes a principle that we can all circle around, like a hundred billion suns can circle around the center of the galaxy. We haven't elected one sun to be the center. And we're still living in that culture where we think that electing a president or a, a board of directors or someone will somehow provide us with the consciousness and the knowing that we all need to negotiate the next level and at one look. What has to be at the center is the mystery. 
And when that mystery is at the center, the ticket to play is everybody has to at least be a sum. So in other words, you have to have enough consciousness as an independent soul to be responsible for your own life and not to be dependent upon the culture around you to give you your reference points. So that's why this is a time for pioneers of people who are emerging early adopters of a new civilization that they don't even know what it is yet. And if they did, they couldn't speak about it because it's a transmission. And that transmission comes as much from the body as it does from consciousness. So you can't have a bill of rights or a constitution or a mission statement that then everybody will follow. That's the consciousness part. And you can't get everybody into sexual freedom. That's the lunar part. It's beyond those. So what we're doing in our work is we're integrating those parts together and we're doing it in group formation. So part of the medicine of coming together in the heart, in love, is that people bring their different gifts. Somebody to develop consciousness so they can hold presence. Wonderful. But often they've denied their body as a result. Somebody else, the serpent goddess, works through, but they may lose presence, just go into trance. Somebody else has really developed the independence of an identity that can be tested against the world. Somebody else is really deeply in their mystic. So in a group, what happens is if you put your individual journey on the altar of the group life, everybody can drink the medicine and they can drink it from each other. So wholeness is created out of the field rather than out of someone who is an exemplar of that wholeness. So that requires this blend between the individual and the collective. And one of the, the two energies that are available for this change are the energies that are above and beneath consciousness. And the energies that are beneath consciousness, once you get beyond that earth as an enchanted being, so to truly see the beauty of the earth, to really feel the waves breaking on the beaches or the winds from the trees as the orgasmic truths that they are, they're ecstatic. The earth is ecstatic. We don't feel that because we are in our story. But when we drop into re-enchanting our body, our body opens to the enchantment of the earth. It re-enchants. It's a chant. It's a sound. It's a, it's a, it's a transmission of the being connecting with the ecstatic being that is earth. And so then that's just the beginning. It's like, the goddess requires us to see her before she opens her mysteries. So we wonder where the change is coming from. And for me, it's coming from two places that are both wild. And the reason they're wild is because we haven't tamed them with our consciousness. And only people brave enough to willing to walk into that which they can't be known can access those energies. One of them is in the earth itself. It's the kundalini power of the earth, waiting for humans to be loving and conscious enough to go down through the crust and to go down through the veils of the ecstatic earth into the raw power that's at the core. And in our own bodies, that's going beneath the sexual serpents into the dragon that lives in the core of every atom. So the black hole at the center of the galaxy is also exists inside every atom. And splitting the atom provides nuclear power. And consciousness that's full of love, that has awakened the body, can go into the body and awaken powers that are waiting. And collectively, we can go into the earth. And those powers are waiting for a new civilization. So that, that's like our inheritance. If you are brave enough to call it, and you have done the work. And the other inheritance is at the core of consciousness. So if you can penetrate the core of the soul, the core of awareness, there is a darkness there, a wild energy that helps create galaxies. And that energy is available to also charge the heart. And when you bring the ascending and the descending currents together, you supernova or explode the heart, which produces a transmission of living from a different place. So that's the civilization that's coming, and many people are 
uh, in different expressions of that. Because remember I said it's ecstatic. It has to come from ecstasy. But for some people, they define ecstasy as embodied ecstasy. So this is these are the people that ecstasy is in your dance. It's in lovemaking. It's in nature. So the erotic is one, the sexual erotic is one form of ecstasy that's necessary for the whole. But it's not the whole. The great eros in the Greek term was the first thing that came out of night. That the whole universe is erotic. That thought can be erotic. That presence of consciousness is erotic. So some people are in a field like this receive their ecstasy through their deep meditation. Some people receive it through the union of love between two people where your hearts just fall through each other. Some people receive it through the ecstatic current of the eros. Some people receive it from deep communion with nature or in contemplation and beauty. So all of these things are necessary for an ecstatic temple because they're all pathways into the great ecstasy. And it's only from that that a civilization will be created. It can't be created because one of us, one smart person, gets up and says, you know what? God downloaded through me the blueprint for the new civilization. If you just follow this path, then you'll get there. So that's not where it comes from. Maybe there are many you know, voices and prophets and so on of each, of each change, but in this time, it's got to come through the global field. The whole of the soul of the earth is in crisis and it's in emergence. So how do we create temples that are really open to that, feel that, encourage that, put that at the center, and let ourselves be oracles of that, let it be revealed through us. So when you have an ecstatic temple and people are in dance together, in surrender to the mystery, then what's revealed is their next step forward individually, <coughs> the gifts of medicine between each other, and also something to do with how we are to live in the future. So the end of that first rant is to say what we're doing individually, our personal development, our awakening of our erotic, our deepening our heart union with each other, and our depth of conscious presence are all just prerequisites for something. They're part of this big thing that's happening on the planet. And that when we do our individual work and our group work, it's in the context of that. So part of what ISTA represents is a, is a global mystery school where the different traditions all can bring their wisdom and something can reveal through the core, but which shows us the way in how to do it. So these new temples that are landing are temples of like, you know, evolution, cosmic evolution experimenting in a laboratory of humans that are giving their consent to that process. <laughs> so for me, it's always a delight to feel a feel. And one of the things I love about this field is the element of community that's so deep here. The horizontal connection between people's hearts that hold each other together in a field despite all of the different you know, components of what it is to take it, to make a group. So as we go around the world to different cultures, and different tribes have different gifts to give them to the global pop of transformational change. So one of the beautiful things for me in coming to Israel too is to connect with the Judaic story and uh, the traditions that are held here because some of our language, our very words, come from particularly the streams of the Hebraic tradition and the Hellenistic. The Hebraic tradition more focused on good and evil and the Hellenistic more focused on the collective gods, gods and goddesses. So I think those two streams of energy are really important to come together. Questions? Yeah, the time for questions. Yeah, you, you talked about the serpent and the conscience, yes. and integration between the both. And in the last journey I did with Ayahuasca, I didn't see any option of integration. There was the conscience, there was the serpent, and they didn't mix. And I don't think they can mix. So 
So how do you do integration about between them? And you also say that there is a, a limit that you can pass through conscience or through the serpent. So if you can a little bit talk about that. So, so you can't bring two things together unless you are outside both of them. Okay, a marriage celebrant is required for a wedding. So if you are consciousness, you can't marry the serpent. And if you are a serpent, you can't marry consciousness unless there's a third part of you, a part of you that is deeper than both. That's the part that can bring them together. Because otherwise, it's just one trying to dominate the other. So that would be the first thing. And, and the way to get to that part is the three paths. One is through the core of consciousness, one is through the serpent and the body, and the third path is through the core of the heart. To add to that, you use the word to mix them. And integration is not mixed. I meant integration. No, but it's important to understand that integration is making is that the two that the two are in peace with each other. That they see that what I'm missing you have and what you're missing I have. So in consciousness and in serpent are each trying to dominate the other, they're basically in fear of it, of the other. Once they go through the heart, they actually can understand the missing piece that each of them has, that actually the other can, can hold. And this missing piece, is, and we'll probably go to that later, is the whole inside. It's like you're, you're full, you're whole, but actually there is a hole inside of you, you're actually like a bagel. <laughs> This this missing piece makes you actually being able to be like a bead on a on a necklace. You can be perforated and be connected. And in, in Kabbalah, it says it's it's the way of saying that maybe you know it from from Chazal. Uh, that the reason that the kingdom of Shaul didn't last, <laughs> anyone knows what Chazal said? No, because he was too perfect. Because he that's how they say. He didn't have a uh, flawless. 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 He was flawless. Yeah, he didn't have a flaw. <clears throat> and David, David had flaws. That's why he can continue. <laughs> yeah? Because he was a sinner, that's why he can continue. The thing is that, and of course, the thing is to realize your flaw, that you're missing something. That whatever, as much perfect as you are, there's something missing. So when consciousness is, when consciousness feels that it's, it's whole, it doesn't realize that there is a, a hole in this hole. And that's hubris. That's arrogance. And that's the cause of separation and, and the fall and the uh, destruction and what's called in Kabbalah Tohu, the Shibirata Kelim, when everybody thinks that they are, you know, I'm the one, I know. When it's true for consciousness, it's true for sexuality, for the body. Both need to know that there's something missing and then they can actually cooperate. Just like in a community, if I think that I, you know, I don't need you, I'm arrogant. When I think that you know, it's, I'm beautiful, but I need you, and you're beautiful, and you need me, we can actually cooperate. So it's, and it's not mixing us, it's actually creating something that is bigger than both of us. Yeah. Yeah. A piece of humility feels like it's absolutely critical for the center to open because almost every tradition produces the phase of spiritual imposter. In other words, our consciousness grasps the thing that we're going for, and then we fake it till we make it and we pretend to be it. And so in this field as well, there is a, a sense of the 
part of us that figures out, okay, so what is this field about? How do I be good at that? And then how do I strengthen my identity as that, as a facilitator or as a whatever? But that just often then creates a new kind of shadow. So I like to say that um, there's, there's no I in the void, so it's really the rock. And you know, one, of the, one of the new things that this is producing is like, as we teach about the void, it becomes a new thing. Like, okay, well, the void told me, or like, I downloaded from the void, or the void is, but it's just a new word. It's like, you know, it's another Sanskrit word, another word to justify doing whatever it is that you're doing, which could just be following your desire, but now the void has given you permission. So our identity is very clever at using any new concept or idea to just reinforce business as usual. So it's very difficult to let ourselves see that we do that. But actually everybody else sees that we do. <laughs> so the power of community is that we we can take the eye out of the void in each other. Because right? the eye is always forming. You know, you don't, you don't just die once, you die every day your eye is the part that comes in and claims the credit for what happened when the eye wasn't there. You know, that your identity is forever just re-emerging by right? rust, and you have to keep dying, and that's what relationships are for. Crack between your two stories, we are in that moment. Yeah. It's like a crack. It's like an earth. The earth is quaking, and we are the Quakers. And yes. Midwives and at the same time, hospice workers of the dying story, and midwives of the new story, which we don't know what the baby will look like. Yes. So, um, you talked about pioneers, and can you say more about the. the because sometimes I think we're. Uh, Habitals, and we are too into midwife in the new story, and we forget about the compassion of the dying story. Yes. How do we take care of a dying story? Uh, uh, of the, the CEO of the bank who might change fully to become a midwife in five years, or for the owner of Exxon, or I don't know. So, can you talk a little more? I can hear about that. It's kind of like you can't have idiot compassion, yeah. which means that actually things need to die. In order for things to be born, things need to die. And our emotional bodies do not want to think about that. We want to think that the people that we love can just like somehow make the change. And But actually, uh, idiot compassion wants emotional harmony on the planet. But for there to be true compassion, you also have to compassion for the part of them that, that has not yet lived, not just for the part that is living in, in the broken story. So for me, that's a fierce dark love. If I got to the end of my incarnation and I knew there were other people awake and they, out of any compassion, did not confront me in a way that challenged me to my core, I, a deep part of me would be pissed with this. Yeah. Even though emotionally I might hate it. So part of the difficulty of when you wake up is you now have a responsibility as what power of humanity that is awake without the arrogance of thinking you know the way. How do you challenge what needs to die in others and in society at the same time as having deep compassion for the power of the next track? And I think everybody has their own answer to that story. Um, but I feel like, in general, we have erred on the side of idiot compassion rather than fierce penetration. So, like, global. And that's what produces uh, basically a new age kind of phenomena, which is everybody just goes to Gola or, you know, somewhere else where they wear the right, you know, clothes, have better orgasms, eat organic food, and the rest of the world will just go, you know, down because it's their choice. And I feel like if we remember that we are part of humanity, we may have to be the voices that penetrate the veils of illusion that people are living in. Any other questions before we take a break? Uh, 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 uh,
uh, be in different terms or different diet. But there's uh, a very strong perception in Kabbalah of uh, El Milvado. No one else beside him. And usually uh, it says that no one Milvado is El Milvado is uh, a Bayak, or Jai's one. So how does this uh, conflict apply to this uh, perception? Yeah. So first of all, I would say, just for you know, giving credit to those who researched it, there's a, a beautiful research done by a professor from Helsinki University. Uh, his name is Simo Paufina. Uh, and he was, he's uh, one of the best in uh, the research of ancient uh, Ashur, Syria. And what he found there is something that looks like a tree that is all the deities of Assyria that are the king. The king there was the embodiment of the tree of all the deities. And he, knowing nothing about Kabbalah or Jewish tradition, now like he's from Helsinki, a Swedish river, where is Helsinki? Finland, Finnish uh, person. Um, he started to search where in, in what religion you can find something like that. And in his article, he brings, you know, from Hindu tradition a little bit, yes, but not that. Then he comes to Kabbalah and said, once I realized that, I'm like, oh, really? This is where it comes from. And then Professor Moshe Idel from Hebrew University. Um, found this, they found each other, and he's, Moshe Idel is one of the, probably the leading professor today of Kabbalah uh, in the world, and, and he said, this is amazing because actually the ancient tradition in Kabbalah says, the Sefer Yitzhira, the book of Yitzhira, says that the origin of, of the Ten Spirit system is the teaching that came from Abraham. Now, where, where did Abraham come from? Assyria. Assyria. Ashur. From the Mesopotamia. He was researching this mystery school of Mesopotamia 3000 BCE. Yeah? Like 5000 years ago. Which is approximately the time of Abraham. In our tradition. Not that Abraham existed as a person, but the, the echo of tradition of like there is some kind of wisdom of the tree of life that is different powers that, that represent the human, there it was the king. One, one beautiful thing that happened probably through Judaism is the democratization of that, that everybody is a king in that way. That everybody is the tree of life. It's not only the king of, Musa, of Ashur. And it's not only the monarch that is like that, but each one of us is the whole tree of life. So that came from there. And, and uh, that's in the research academic thing. But whatever, those, the whole Middle East was connected in different ways and different deities were res resonating other deities. So, um, as Rav Zalman said, you know, El Asherah, Baal, El Nanat, Rav Mabina, Zimbabwe. The thing is, and I said it when I spoke, A, in all ancient traditions that realized, that spoke about deities, they always had the realization that there is oneness behind that. There's one that's behind the expression of this God and that Goddess. There's one is that is mysterious and unknown. But it's considered to be for the Yacht in Kabbalah. That like now in Kabbalah, Kabbalah. yes. Yeah. No. But that's, just, that's one of the things that you need to, when you look in these traditions, you need to really synthesize and realize what's like, you know, what's the essence and what is the clothing that came to fit into the tradition so it can survive. 
So one of the things was taking Yudhe Vavhe, <coughs> putting it in different, and um, mystifying, mystif <coughs> mystifying, <coughs> mystifying uh, Yudhe Vavhe, Havaya, in a beautiful way. But the other part of it is making Yudhe Vavhe basically as a god, an entity. And this is really idolatry. <laughs> I actually, I want to tell you, the, I, I was a student of the Rabbi Nibels, of the Benzadeh, that was my first teacher, and he told me once. Rabbi Nibels is the, one of the uh, leaders of the ultra-Orthodox uh, world today in the world. And I, I was very connected, very personally connected to him. I had a lot, a lot of one on ones with him, and he said to me personally, when someone worships when someone worships the name of God, this is idolatry. Because God is not the name of God. This is a representation that the divine is nameless. Oneness is nameless. Oneness is a mystery. And the, the idolatry that became Judaism is taking a, a name, creating it as a deity, as a big ego, that loves when you do this and don't love when you eat cheese and chicken together. You know, I, this is a deification of the mystery. Which is you, in a way, it's easier in this tradition because God and the devil are polarized so powerfully that you just need to bring those together and pop out. Where now the traditions there are so many gods that they don't cast each other. <laughs> Is it to break through the story? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I see the question about the, 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 the you using the, 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 the you know, you were saying that the, no, I need to be a little bit <laughs> <laughs> You want to speak in Hebrew and I'll go and say, okay, so maybe like you said, something about ecstatic civilization, and so on. Civilization born and died from ecstatic situations, so from ecstatic states. And I would like to just say, who do you feel that you can, why do you say that, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, in a way, it's similar to what I was just talking about, is that, is that behind the archetypal realm of all of the gods and goddesses is the emptiness, which is the great perfection, which is ecstatic. And so out of that arises our gods and our goddesses and our spiritual traditions and our ideas and all of those things. And for many people, they get possessed by those because these are big powers, archetypal powers, like a civilization that runs for a thousand years through through millions of people, that's a big being. And so to break that, you have to go to the ecstatic that that being came from. Okay, you can't, Einstein said, you can't change things from inside the reality that that created. So if civilizations are burst out of the void, then they can only die from that place and the new ones be burst as well. So we're fish in an ocean, and unless we go deeply and penetrate into the origins of our civilization, we can't change it. We're just shifting the deck chairs around. And the, the point of getting into the void is like the equation of getting across the event horizon of the black hole. And what the self wants to do is it wants to go to the edge of the black hole, but not go in. Because at the edge, you can have the, have the idea of being enlightened. But endarkenment is to die, for the, the, for the I to die into the mystery. And so it's the same thing as people do in relationship. We want to come all the way close to loving someone, but we don't want to die. We want to come all the way close to sexual surrender, but we don't want to sexually surrender because those are three places we die. And, you, and the only way that you can be ecstatic is to have died 
and therefore you're no longer in a place of tension of trying to live on the edge of not dying. So for a civilization to die, some many people in that civilization need to be in the ecstatic state, which means you're already dead. You, you have nothing to fear from the civilization, you're not controlled by the civilization because you have gone to the root of it and fallen into it, so you can emerge afresh. Like a person is being born from ecstasy, that's the orgasm of your parents. And at least it was in my case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and death is, is, is ecstatic. Every individual's death is ecstatic. Birth and birth and death are ecstatic for the individual, same for civilization. Do we have an instant that we record or an example of this? So, for example, in Greek civilization, you know, the origins beneath all of Plato and Archimedes, blah, 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 were the, what were called the incubators. So there were people who went into the dark, that went into caves, dropped themselves into the mystery, and out of that came all of the gods and the goddesses, and the, the, the civilization emerged from people going into the mystery. And so the same in our tradition, our spiritual traditions have, it ends in the non-dual state. And our sexual traditions also end in that. That's when there is a letting go of the identity that is going into the mystery to bring something back. And now the individual is not someone separate from the mystery. It is the mystery inside humanity. So... An initiate of the mysteries is not someone who has understood the mysteries. It's the mystery itself that has perforated the individual because they've died and let themselves be a vessel of the mysteries now rather than be someone who knows the mysteries. Does that make sense? The prophets are people who are in ecstasy. The prophets that created the, this civilization, you know, the Bible of prophets, they were in ecstasy. The first Christians were in ecstasy. They didn't care about being crucified, being killed. They were ecstatic. Every new people that come with the light of something new, they come with ecstasy. Like Copernicus, for example, that really meant that the earth went around the sun in the 16th century. When you read his works, he is, he is speaking about ecstasy. He's talking about a whole group of them who know something that the civilization around them doesn't know. They can barely sleep at night because they are vibrating ecstatically with the impact of this lightning that arose in their consciousness. So that's ecstasy. Something living in you that's way beyond you. I can say the same thing about the bed shipments. Bad shipments or like bad uh, changes in the world that also come from this <coughs> ecstasy of uh, like change from like the let's say Nazi for example or like you describe in your book the guy who started to write what he's downloading yeah. it's the same as it's happening for the good part. Like something new. Uh, every, every, every civilization, of course. The Third Reich of the Nazis came from ecstasy. Yeah. Yeah. It was very mystical. Ecstasy will bring us to the benefits or to the third part of it. We'll just try and <laughs> see. In fact, the first step is to become authentic. Most human beings are not authentic, they're living in someone else's life. First thing is to become authentic. <coughs> then offer your authenticity on the altar of civilization. So in other words, now your individual is also linked to the archetypal energies. And the archetypal energies that you are in service to the collective will accelerate your journey. But unless you are also connected to the boy, then you can be possessed by those energies and maybe, you know, maybe that's not a great thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the journey. You play with fire, you learn how to handle that fire, you learn how to play with archetypal forces, but the only way you can stay when playing with those forces is if you have gone deeply into the mystery. So just, and we bring that all the way back to, you go into a temple. If you're just going down into sexual surrender, 
but you lose presence, what happens? Or if you just go up into presence and you're in the non-dual transmitting the void and you disconnect from your body, then lack of integration, lack of wholeness happens. If they are balanced and integrated, then there's an opportunity for the ecstatic to come through. So I will not really listen to anyone unless I can hear the cells of their body singing in ecstasy as well as their consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about integration because if someone's consciousness is not in ecstasy, if their body is like a rock, then I'm not sure that I want the life that they're living transmitted. So integration helps, and that's why it's so important in the embodiment. 